All right. Hi, everyone. Can you all see me? See me okay? Everyone logged on all right? <laughs> awesome. So um, before we get started, I'm just going to go over some housekeeping. For those of you guys that haven't used Zoom before, you'll notice down the bottom there is a chat function. Um, if you're on your phone and you don't see that, there should be a little button that says more. If you press that, it'll open up um, a couple of options that, um, and chat should be under there. If you guys have any questions throughout the talk, just start putting them down into that chat box. So I'll leave questions to the end, um, but I'll actually go through them. So you can start popping them down and we'll come back to them at the end. Um, like I said, you guys are all on mute just because um, the mics pick up everything. And so for the recording to go well, I don't, um, you know, you guys, there's bobs and kids and all that that always kind of come on in the background. Um, Okay, and like I said, people are probably people might join in a little later on um, throughout the talk, which is completely fine. Um, there's no password, so everyone can kind of just come in when they can. And as you guys all know, there is also a recording, so this will all get sent out to everybody. Um, before I get started, I do just want to say a big thank you to Playgroup Queensland, um, specifically the Sunshine Coast Hub down at Mons. Um, Michelle is online. I don't know if you guys all had know Michelle. Michelle runs Playgroup um, as well as Claire. If it wasn't for those guys, um, you know, this wouldn't even be possible. Um, I think we were just trying to put our heads together on how we could support mums better, particularly during COVID and everything that's going on. So you know, we decided we'd try and do this talk online. I have done this a couple of times um, actually at Playgroup. So this was just our version of trying to access more mums um, to help support you guys through this time. Um, if you haven't already, they uh, Michelle is running a online Playgroup for mums. I think it's mums um, with kids up until 12 months. Is that right, Michelle? I think it's, yeah, up until 12 months. So there's an online Playgroup um, that you guys can all join up for, I guess, up until Playgroup reopens and we can all get back out to actually face-to-face -face visits and stuff too. So have a look at that. Um, before, I think that was pretty much all I needed to tell you in regards to housekeeping. Um, like I said, we'll leave questions until the end. I'll get through the talk um, and I will announce the, the giveaway winner as well at the end. So make sure you, um, hang on the line for that. So, so we'll get started. Um, welcome to Nourishing First Foods, the when, what and why of starting solids. Um, thanks so much for being here. I know it's not easy, even if you are at home though, I think this is probably a bit more convenient for a lot of mums as well, just being able to sit at home and not have to go out anywhere. Um, for those of you that don't know me, there are a couple that do. Uh, my name's Sissy and I'm the owner of Absolute Potential Health and Performance. Um, it's an integrative wellness studio in Mons, literally five minutes from Playgroup. And um, basically, I'm what I am really passionate about is helping families and kids basically to achieve their um, best health using a really holistic approach. So I'm a qualified nutritionist, um, a registered physiotherapist with a special interest in pediatrics as well as women's health, as well as a lifestyle coach. So I tend to combine all those things to provide a holistic approach to the clients that I work with. Um, I'm also a mum to a two-year-old. So I think for me, life changed a lot with how I work when I had my little girl. So something that I really try and do is give um, realistic, op realistic solutions I guess because I know it's not easy trying to keep yourself healthy trying to keep your family healthy when you've got kids to deal with and going back to work and stuff so that's what I'm really passionate about and that's part of why I um, like to do these talks as well because I think it's about educating you guys as much as possible um, so that you know what you're um, kind of doing and where you should go because it's it, it is it's really overwhelming all the stuff um, all the information that you can find out there as well so Probably, um, oh, before I do start, just again, this information is not intended to replace medical advice or a one-on-one -on -one appointment. So just keep in mind that every child is different. So you, it does need to be considered in context of each individual case. So I'll start off with probably the you know, most obvious question um, is what age should my baby start solids? Um, can I get just a bit of an indication of how old everyone's bubs are here? So is there, who online is um, either pregnant or has a bub sort of zero to four months? You guys can practice the typing something in. Um, so I've got almost six months. Two months, so yeah, a little uh, younger, 
it's good to see that you're on wanting to find out a little bit more about it. I know there's some mums, yeah, 10 months, some mums on here whose mums are a little bit older. Uh, so bubs are a little bit older, 22. Yep. Awesome. So, oh, one of my friends is waiting to be let in. Okay. Uh, Sorry, uh, Natasha, the, there, there shouldn't be a password, so that she should just be able to join the meeting. Um, she should just be able to join the meeting as long as she's got the login without me having to let her in, if you can hear that. Just let me know if there's technical, dif there is always technical difficulties, sorry, everyone, um, but we'll try and get as many people in as possible. So until that gets sorted, no, that's all right. Um, okay, so basically, so there's a bit of a broad range in regards to what everyone's babies um, or not only babies are at. Um, the World Health Organization or the WHO actually recommends that babies are exclusively breastfed up until six months of age. So that's breastfed or on formula with continued breastfeeding plus complementary foods until two years of age. So they do encourage mums to breastfeed until 12 months um, with milk being the main drink of this time. Um, that's also supported by the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia. Um, across the board, pretty much most organisations recommend that solids shouldn't be started earlier than four months. But I think that leaves that bit of a grey area. I know a lot of mums are sort of considering what about that sort of four to six months. And that's kind of where I think a lot of mums can get a little bit confused. Um, a survey of Australian mums back in 2010, a little while back now, actually found that a lot of mums were starting solids a little bit early than the recommended guidelines. So I guess it kind of begs the question of, you know, why six months? Why is that even a recommendation? Why should you wait till six months if you're considering it earlier? Um, around that age, infant feeding behaviour has started to progress. So going from sort of a sucking behaviour, they now can start to bite foods. Most bubs can actually start to chew by seven to nine months. And most babies can actually manage finger foods by eight months. So at that age, they're also developmentally ready. So they're better able to sit up and hold their head upright, which is really quite important. Um, they're more interested in their surroundings, in food in general. And importantly, um, the tongue extrusion reflex has actually disappeared. So you might, some of you might have found that what happens when you try and put something in a little bub's mouth early on is that they automatically push it out. So that has started to basically disappear around that six months of age. Importantly, infants' appetite and nutritional needs aren't satisfied any longer by breast milk um, or formula from about six months of age. So specifically, um, iron, for example, and zinc, they start to decrease. So above first year of life, their body stores of iron actually comes from what they've gotten from you guys in the womb. So around six months, that starts to deplete and they start to require sources from what they're basically eating. Their digestive system has also matured, so they're better able to digest things like um, proteins and starches. Prior to that, they don't have high enough levels of certain enzymes that help break that down. So bubs that are given um, solids too early can actually start to have issues with things like diarrhea or um, having issues with not being able to digest food, for example. Interestingly, they found that bubs that are introduced to solids at six months um, as opposed to earlier, actually adjust to eating solids a lot more quickly, um, potentially highlighting why kids, um, sorry, infants are, um, I guess, developmentally ready at that age. Um, I will make a note though that that exact age depends on your child. So there are gonna be babies that aren't ready at six months. Um, some may not be ready for solids until about eight months. And that can be to do with particular developmental um, issues, delayed motor development, prem bubs as well. So um, is anyone here, has anyone here had a baby that was premature? Yep, nodding, couple of nods. So up until two years of age, um, you wanna be looking at your bub's corrected age if your bub is premature. So for those of you that don't know, corrected age is basically um, the age that your baby would have been if, um, if we're taking into account their prematurity. So if they were born four weeks early, for example, um, and so yeah, four weeks early, and they're now three months of age, their corrected age would actually be two months. So that's the age that you'd be going with, with regard to particular milestones, for example. So um, 
that's what you want to be looking at. And in those babies, even though their you know, actual age may show that they're ready for solids, they are actually a little bit younger. So that's what you want to be going with when, um, with regard to trying to figure out when to start solids. So then, um, you know, what should you be feeding your baby? Um, I think this is uh, something that a lot of moms can feel a little bit confused about, a little bit overwhelmed with as well, because there's a lot of different options out there. Starting off with, um, there is that recommendation that breast milk or formula should be continued and should stay the main drink until 12 months of age. You can offer your bubs cooled boiled water, um, some bubs if they're a little bit dehydrated or if they're sick for some reason, and that may be a, a time to offer them that. Um, but definitely breast milk or formula should be the main drink up until 12 months. Babies naturally have a preference for sweet foods. So you are more likely to have success with naturally sweet foods like carrots or sweet potato, um, pumpkin, the sort of foods that you tend to see in, you know, infant foods that are offered, you know, ready-made sort of things. Um, and that is, like I said, they do tend to prefer those foods um, initially. If you're wanting to get them to eat other foods, um, you can combine it with those sweeter foods as well. So you can be adding in, you know, things like your zucchini or your broccoli pureed with that little bit of pumpkin, for example. You do want to be going for organic, spray-free and minimally processed as much as possible. Um, infants and kids are particularly vulnerable to the effects of chemicals and pesticides because their organs aren't fully developed. So that means they also have an immature detoxification system, which means they um, are less able to get rid of those toxins that can be present on conventional fruit and veggies. Do keep in mind as well that these toxicants are passed through your breast milk. So if you're also breastfeeding, making sure that your diet is as um, you know, spray free and low tox as possible is also really important. In regards to then order or type, I, I know there's certain, um, I have seen certain protocols that recommend going in a particular order in regards to vegetables or when to start meats and um, those kind of things. To be honest, generally, any sort of order or type is actually fine. The most important thing that you want to be going for is choosing um, foods initially that are as nutrient dense and as high in iron as possible, as well as those foods that are supportive of their gut lining and their microbiome. And that, again, is to do with the fact that their immune system, sorry, not their immune system, their digestive system isn't well developed. So you want to be giving them as many things to support that, um, that, um, that gut as much as possible. So because iron is that nutrient that tends to be depleted, again, you want to be looking at foods that are high in that so they can start to get it from their foods. I prefer um, getting them from food sources as opposed to, I know something quite typical is something like a iron fortified cereal what you do need to consider with that is one cereal isn't naturally high in iron so it is being processed and having iron added to it um, the other thing is that i mentioned briefly that starches are something that are a little bit tricky a little bit harder for bubs to digest early on um, the other important thing to consider too is the the um, percentage of iron absorption is much less in things like cereals. So when you compare, I think it's a, it's about 15% absorption when they're getting iron from you know meats or whole foods, for example, compared to 3% in cereals. So if you're going whole foods, um, you're going to have a better chance of them getting appropriate amounts of those nutrients as well. Some um, you know, examples of uh, sort of high in iron foods include things like grass-fed beef, liver, um, salmon or fish, um, egg yolk, as well as things like avocado and banana are also quite good. And um, I will go into allergenic foods in a little bit as well, just for those that are you know, hearing fish and eggs and thinking, oh, I don't know if I should give um, you know, my bub that. Um, Potentially, the only thing to maybe consider is what I mentioned about starchy carbohydrates and, and grains. So because of the immaturity of their digestive system and their guts being a little more leaky, um, potentially delaying grains um, until closer to, a, to one year can help prevent or reduce the incidence of diarrhea and things like that that tends to happen quite commonly when a bub starts solids. Um, 
The key to reducing the impact of grains is to make sure they're getting adequate amounts of gut supportive vitamins and nutrients as well. Another thing to consider as well is um, making sure you're picking the right texture, um, but then also progressing that texture. So we all kind of instinctually know that we need to start off with something like a puree. And that's because the bubs, bubs are most, they're used to sucking. So they're not used to actually having to chew and swallow and process foods and they need practice for that. So you want to be giving them obviously things that are closer to more that, um, you know, puree liquidy type texture, but it is important that you do start to progress them quite quickly. So there was a study that found that bubs that weren't given lumpy foods until after 10 months of age, that they actually seem to have issues um, at around one and a half years in terms of tolerating those kind of foods. So there seems to be a bit of a critical window of opportunity for bubs to take on those textured foods. Now, in regards to allergenic foods, so I think this is one that a lot of mums get a little bit nervous about, um, you know, things like eggs and fish and peanuts. Um, they've actually, the newest um, recommendations have actually said now that you do want to be a, introducing potentially allergenic foods before the age of 12 months. So there was a few years back, I think a bit of a, a mindset that especially if you have a family history of things like peanuts and stuff, that you shouldn't give your bub um, those kind of foods. They actually found that that increased the incident of allergies. So if you weren't to give your bub things um, like eggs and fish and peanuts, they were actually more likely to develop an allergy down the track. So um, as especially with peanuts as well, there are very clear recommendations today that that should be introduced before the age of 11 um, as a preventative measure to reduce allergies, particularly in kids that are at high risk. So we're not talking about peanuts themselves because obviously from a choking point of view, that's not something that we want to be um, giving to kids, but we're looking at peanut pastes, for example, um, almond butters, those kind of things. Um, is there anyone here that whose bub has a cow's milk allergy or a dairy allergy? No, I can't see everyone all at once. Um, interestingly, this is something that I come across in clinic quite a lot. I would probably say every second or third kid. Yeah, so one mum did say yes. Every second or third kid that I see seems to have um, a cow's milk or a dairy allergy. It's pretty common. So in Australia and New Zealand, it's about 2%, which is about one in 50 kids um, have an allergy to cow's milk. Children will outgrow this, most of them anyway, by around three to five years of age, but it can be quite distressing. Um, these are bubs who, as soon as they have anything with milk, and this can include cow's milk formula as well, that they will have things like um, blood in the stools, rashes, diarrhea, vomiting, um, so quite a severe allergy. Um, potentially, um, one theory may be it's to do with the, um, the casein protein in um, cow's milk, which is a lot higher, and that immature digestive system, which just can't tolerate those proteins. There are certain... Um, probiotic strains um, that can actually help improve tolerance in infants with a cow's milk allergy. So if you do have a bub with a cow's milk allergy, mo I have found that most kids can take those, um, take forms of dairy later on, a little bit later, I wouldn't recommend starting straight away as a first food. Um, but there are, like I said, certain probiotic strains that can actually help improve or um, enable them to take on dairy a little bit quicker than if they weren't. So just to reiterate, there's no evidence that delayed introduction to allergenic foods reduces the risk of food allergies, um, but that it may actually contribute to a higher occurrence of allergies down the track. The other um, strategy that can really help when starting to give bubs allergenic foods is continuing to breastfeed. So breast milk contains um, a high level of immune enhancing factors. It's something that they haven't been able to replicate in formula. Um, there are some formulas, I haven't seen any in Australia that do contain pre and probiotics, but um, you know, from a um, immune protective point of view, breast milk is gonna help um, your child to be able to cope with those allergenic foods as they start to eat them. 
So then in regards to what should you avoid, um, there are some pretty obvious ones, which I'm sure most of you guys know. Um, the first one is salt. So again, it's to do with that immaturity of your infant's um, organs. So that their kidneys aren't very immature, aren't very mature, sorry. So giving them too much salt or processed sort of foods that have a lot of table salt added um, can be a little bit too much load on their kidneys and then just not able to excrete that. It is still important, some salt, um, in order to rehydrate cells and for cells to function, but you do want to make sure you're looking for a minimally processed salt um, and to use it sparingly as well. Sugar is probably the big one. Um, as I said, kids have a strong preference for sweet early on. So early exposure to sugar and a lot of it can promote a sweet taste preference, which means that they can be predisposed to obesity down the track. Um, interestingly, um, it's also been linked to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which um, a lot of us think of it as an adult disease. It's actually quite a, a rising pediatric condition as well. And that has been linked to a lot of sugar and a lot of um, a high sugar intake early in life. The big thing as well with sugar is um, dental cavities as well. Um, when we actually eat sugary foods, what happens is that bacteria in our mouth help to digest that sugar. They then produce acid, which can break down the, the dental enamel. Um, and that is what can then lead to obviously cavities. Um, the WHO actually states, and I'll quote, free sugars are the essential dietary factor in the development of dental caries or cavities because dental cavities does not occur in the absence of dietary sugars. So what that actually means is that you can be brushing your kids' teeth as much as possible, but if you get to the source of what's actually causing them to um, potentially have teeth issues, um, that's gonna save you a lot of time down the track. So kids that don't actually eat a lot of sugar in their diet are gonna be much less likely to develop cavities in general, something that just teeth brushing isn't going to um, you know, really help as much. So in terms of sugar, um, obviously that also takes into account drinks. So we're looking at juices, cordial, soft drinks, sweetened drinks, especially if it's drunk from a bottle um, that does seem to bathe the, the teeth in more of that sugary liquid. Before six months of age, there's no nutritional benefit for giving kids these kind of drinks. And after six months of age, there's no nutritional benefit of giving them sweetened drinks over whole fruit. Um, so basically, if you know, basically what that's saying is that there's no really, there's no really any reason to be giving your kids, um, you know, juice or like I said, cordials or soft drinks at all. Um, all you kind of get with it is an increased risk of, like I said, dental issues, um, obesity, as well as a risk of malnutrition because te kids that drink a lot of juices and soft drinks tend to then um, drink those as opposed to more nutritional things like breast milk, um, they tend to have a lower appetite for healthier foods in general as well. So that's something to consider. Um, cow's milk before 12 months as well, um, it may be associated with an increased risk of iron deficiency. Um, the high calcium intake in dairy can actually decrease iron absorption. And remembering also that cow's milk has a higher amount of casein, that, that protein in milk, which uh, may be too much for their developing kidneys as well. A couple of other things. Um, so honey before 12 months, um, that's a relatively new one. They found that there's um, spores of um, Clostridium botulism, uh, blot, botulinum, sorry, <laughs> which can actually cause infant botulism um, if they're given to kids before a year old. An obvious one is things like whole nuts, seeds, raw carrots, whole grapes, apple chunks, celery seeds, due to the choking and inhalation risk. Um, so your bub's pharynx, so basically the portion of their throat that goes down to their stomach and their lungs is about three centimeters wide. So it's not, it, you know, it's not very big, but anything that can fit into that kind of area is going to be a choking risk. Um, choking basi basically occurs when food goes rather than down into the esophagus, into the stomach, it actually goes down in towards the lungs or can just stay lodged in the um, throat itself. I am gonna go into more detail on choking um, 
a little later in this talk. So we'll definitely get into some factors of how you can make sure that doesn't happen. Cause I, I know that's another big thing that a lot of people are worried about. Um, so when to start giving those kind of foods, um, Definitely not before six months. Some say not before three years. I will say that depends on a child's oromotor ability and the common sense of, you know, you guys. My little girl is two and a half and, and you know, she can eat whole grapes and, you know, nuts and things like that. Um, so she's not yet that three years old, but she's able to have those things safely. Again, it's something that you obviously want to supervise and just, like I said, have a bit of common sense about as well. Another thing um, that some people might not have thought about is a very high protein diet, especially before four months. So if you're not starting solids until four months, it's probably not really an issue. But again, that has to do with the fact that their immune, um, their digestive system, system isn't yet fully developed and their gut's that little bit leaky. So big protein molecules can get absorbed and basically contribute to aller aller allergic reactions as well. So we touched already on, um, you know, how what your baby eats affects their health. I talked about sugar consumption and dental cavities as well as obesity and malnutrition. There's a couple of other things that I know um, have come up with mums too. Um, some, a lot of mums come to me um, with worried about the effects of um, certain foods on a, children, a child's behavior, for example. Um, I haven't seen a lot of studies, but anecdotally, and I have seen um, kids in clinic that um, have um, ADHD or autism or hyperactivity or even anxiety, whose mums um, say that definitely when they have a lot of sugar or if they have things like Coke, that their anxiety and their hyperactivity gets worse. Um, I actually think this is potentially more to do with the effect that sugar can have on blood glucose levels. If you look at studies in um, adults with depression, poor management of blood glucose levels can actually make their symptoms worse. So when you think of eating something that's very sugary, what tends to happen is your blood glucose level rises and then it drops again. And that, it's that drop in blood glucose level that can actually um, mimic or cause a worsening of things like anxiety, um, like I said, that depression, because of the effect that it has on um, adrenaline and cortisol production. So it can actually be that sort of up and down of poorly regulated blood glucose that has more of an issue, that that's more of an issue um, in regards to behavior. I know my little girl gets absolutely hangry if she hasn't eaten for a little while. And as soon as I give her something to eat, she's completely fine. So I would say it's more that as opposed to um, sugar per se. When you're eating foods that have protein and fat in them, that actually keeps your blood glucose levels a lot more level. You don't get that same spike and drop. So just sugar alone will definitely cause that up and down. Um, food choices early on also impact on um, your baby's immunity and their gut health. And that's something that we're all concerned about, I think, in today's day and age. Um, their microbiome, which is linked to them having a good immune system, is definitely more sensitive um, to toxicants and um, adverse factors, like I mentioned. And it's not actually fully developed till about three years of age. So those first three years of age are really important for us to be able to build up their gut microbiome so that they can be healthier, so that their immune system does become stronger. That really... Um, can be affected by food choices. Um, some things that some mums might not have thought about are things like, for example, um, conventional sultanas and processed foods, even store-bought fish, for example, um, tend to be um, tend to contain what's called sulfites, which is basically a preservative. Those things have been found to have a negative effect on um, the good bacteria in our bubs guts so that's a whole other topic though um i have done a talk just on gut health um in mums and babies so that's something that potentially we could do online as well if there's enough interest for that but that's a whole other um yeah it's a whole other lecture there's so much more on that topic that we can actually be talking about okay um all right so i've gone through a bit of information and i've got still a bit of stuff to go through so given that we've only got about half an hour and I want to leave plenty of time for questions I might go straight into safe feeding and how to reduce choking risk and I um, 
we'll skip over baby led weeding depending on you know how we go with time um but when i send you guys all out the recording i'll also send you out a um a document with all the notes from this so all those mums that are interested in baby led weeding there'll be information in there as i said if i do get a chance i'll go into it at the end but i might go into as i said safe feeding guidelines and how to re reduce choking risk um because I think that's something that a lot of mums starting out with solids are a little bit worried about. So I actually came up with a bit of an acronym um, and I put together a bit of a tip sheet, which um, I'll email out to you. If anyone wants an actual physical printed out copy that they can pop on their fridge, just let me know and I can happy to post one out to you guys as well. But basically um, I came up with the acronym PASTE, P-A-S-T-E, as a way to just remember some things um, to basically reduce choking risk. So P stands for being prepared. So you want to make sure your baby is developmentally prepared to start solids. So more than just looking at their age, you want to look for some physical signs that they're ready to actually start eating solid foods. So one, they should be sitting upright and be able to hold their head up unsupported. They should start to show interest in their food and surroundings. They no longer are pushing objects out through their mouth. And they're well and calm. So starting solids is, is a really complex and new task. So you want to make sure you choose a time when your baby's healthy and not stressed. So you don't probably want to be doing it if your bub's just about to start childcare or something, um, because that is another stress that they're having to go through. A stands for awake and alert. So again, this is um, another really important factor to consider to minimize choking risk. When bubs are tired, a little bit sleepy, or just sick, they're less likely to be able to maintain that upright posture that you actually need for safe eating. Um, their throat and upper airway muscles tend to relax, um, and that makes it more likely to close off and for foods to get stuck. So they'll also be less likely to show any interest in solids. So you kind of want to get them at a good time um, when they're alert, like I said, and awake. Otherwise, you guys both might end up just totally stressed out with the whole, um, with the whole uh, starting solids thing. S is for sit and supervise. So sitting, you want to make sure your child is sitting um, upright and well supported in a high chair, for example. This aligns their head and body optimally and directs food away from their airway and towards their esophagus. Um, to help prevent choking. You don't want to be offering them food on the run when they're lying down. Even propped up on a couch in front of the TV is not optimal at all. Um, it does affect their digestion negatively. And like I said, it, sh it shouldn't be encouraged as it can increase that risk of choking. The other S is for supervision, which is a really important one. You always want to be watching your baby and be present when you're starting to feed them, even if you are doing something like baby led weaning where they're a little bit more self motivated. Choking is scarily often silent. So you won't even hear your baby choking and it can happen in seconds. So that turning away to, you know, check the stove or something like that, it could happen that quickly. So you want to make sure, particularly when you start solids, you're watching your bub and you're making sure that they're um, all right as you're doing it. T stands for texture. So I spoke about this briefly. Um, you want to make sure that you're offering your infants the correct texture to, a, to, pre to prevent choking. So because young bubs usually don't have many teeth and because they've only sucked um, you know, liquid up until now, they do need that practice to learn how to chew and swallow properly. So generally we're looking at those smooth, softer foods with a more runny consistency, um, a bit easier for bubs to manage initially, um, and is less likely to get stuck in their airways. You then want to progress to those more challenging textures like mash or grated or lumpy foods um, with those hard raw foods coming last and always with supervision. So as an example, um, you know, you're looking at potentially steamed carrot, for example, that you then blend into a puree. The next progression on top of that is steamed carrot that's just roughly mashed with a fork. Then potentially those steamed carrot sticks. And then last would be raw carrot sticks. E is for encourage, don't force. So this is a big one. If your bub's not interested in eating or doesn't seem interested, don't force them. I know a lot of us get to um, you know, a point or a certain age where we're just like, oh, you know, they should be starting. But if your bub really doesn't want to, unless there is a medical reason um, potentially for why they're not taking solids sort of a little bit later on, 
that you want to get cleared out. But in general, you don't want to force your bub to eat. You, I would, con, I would recommend continuing to offer them something that's appropriate at each meal. Um, let them play with it, squash, feel the food, um, even if most of it ends up on the floor. It's a really important part of their development and helps them get comfortable with food and different textures. But you don't want to be forcing them. Um, you want meal times to be fun and you don't want it to become super stressful for you or baby. They will eat when they're ready and um, every child is unique, okay? So you've got to remember that too. Um, I actually just found online, there was actually a really cool um, choke check tool, which I'll um, email out to you guys as well. That was released by the Australian Competition and Consumer um, Commission. Basically, it was, uh, so it's an A4 PDF. I'll actually, I'll share the screen with you guys so you can have a look at what I'm talking about. You can basically print this one out and um, cut it out. Let's see if I can show you this. Um, oh, that's not the right one. Um, let me see if I can find it. Can you guys all see that? So basically this little blue thing here, you basically cut it out to size and what it forms is, um, it actually forms a cylinder that mimics the size of your baby's throat up until um, 36 months. So you, you can actually use that and use it to check to see what things fit in. And if anything fits in, it's gonna be a choking risk. So you can use it for food. You can actually also use it for um, you know, toys and things like that you've got around the house. It's based on a tool that they use in toy factories um, and different companies when producing parts to basically determine whether something is a choking risk um, or not. So I'll add that into the notes in the email for you guys as well, because I thought that was quite a handy little free tool that um that was out there all right so then i guess just um final thoughts on the whole issue um don't underestimate or forget the influence that you guys have on your baby um especially as they get older your kids are going to eat what you eat so starting solids can actually be a really great time for us as parents as mums to start to improve our own health and to revamp our own nutrition and dietary habits you know, I think all of us want our kids to be healthy, fit and strong, but we often forget that, you know, we're the biggest influence on our kids and their primary example. So you have a really great responsibility and it's, um, it's actually also kind of exciting too um, to think that you have a chance to be able to influence their health down the track. So their health as adults, their risk of obesity, their risk of chronic disease, their immune system, by what you're giving them, what you're providing them with, particularly um, in those first few years of life. Um, I know it can be hard. I know processed and convenience foods are often easier that's why the convenience foods um, you do need to keep in mind that they are manufactured to be addictive so you know what kids not going to want to eat chocolate and stuff like that but just because they are you know just because they want them doesn't necessarily mean that you should be giving it to them particularly when you're thinking about that foundation that you're building for them at this age so you want to make sure that um, you know you're going as healthy as possible, um, you know, try and make the right choices for your children because it's probably not going to be any other time in your life where you have complete control over their habits um, and over their food. So you do have a really great opportunity now to be able to influence their later health um, as well. So that was the bulk of my talk. Um, I'm going to open it up now if anyone's got any questions. Um, if we don't have any questions, I can go into baby led weaning. So does anyone have any questions um, with what I've talked about? Like I'm happy to, if you guys want to just pop them in the, um, in the chat. I think I mentioned at the start, um, there's a little chat icon down the bottom. If you can't see it, you, there's a little more button that you can press, um, which will open up a chat. So. Did anyone have any questions at all? No. Um, 
Danielle says, my thoughts on store-bought iron fortified seeds. Oh, yes, I did. So um, Danielle asked um, what my thoughts were on store-bought iron fortified cereals. So um, the point that I was making with iron fortified cereals is that um, one, I prefer whole foods. Um, and if you can get a food that's naturally high in iron, one, it's going to be more bioavailable and two, it's not going to be as processed. So um, the, the what I was talking about there was the absorption of iron from an iron fortified cereal is only about 3%, whereas the absorption of iron from something like, um, say, eggs or you know meat, for example, is closer to 15%. So the bioavailability is a lot higher from foods that are naturally high in iron. It's in a form that your bub knows what to do with. Um, and as I said, it's, it's not as processed, obviously. The other thing to consider is the point that I made about um, starches and carbohydrates very early on bubs can have some issues with digesting um, those particular um, macronutrients as well. Um, Angie says, I've heard it's good to minimize the amount of fruit we introduce to babies in preference for vegetables. What do I think? Um, yeah, so that goes back to the um, point that I made about kids having a natural preference for sweet. Um, I've got nothing against fruit at all, but definitely when you're starting foods, when you're starting um, solids with bubs, if you start off with fruits, you will probably find it's a little bit harder to get them onto vegetables just because, like I said, we all like sweets. Um, they actually have no idea what foods, you know, they have no idea about fruits and vegetables. Um, and you'll find that your bubs, if you can start them on more of those savory type vegetables early on, they're going to start to develop that preference and be more open to eating it down the track as well. Whereas trying to introduce them later down the track can be a little bit trickier. Yeah. All kids will want to eat fruit. You're going to have no problems getting your kid to eat fruit. So you want to be trying to get them um, eating those vegetables as much as possible. Yeah, Matthew and Helen, oh, I think it's Helen potentially. Is it true to feed solids after you breastfeed them? Um, do you mean the order? So breastfeed them first and then give them solids? Is that what your question's about? Um, yeah, yeah, um, it really depends. Um, it depends on a few different things. Um, of obviously, continuing to breastfeed while you know, having solids, I mentioned that in regards to reducing allergies is important. It depends on what you want to do. So if your bub doesn't have a huge appetite, if you're feeding them breast, if you're breastfeeding them first and then trying to give them solids, which they're not really sure about, they've never really done, it's going to be a little bit more of a struggle because they're already going to be full and they're not going to want to try something. They're going to be less likely to try something that potentially um, you know you want them to start off with. So if you if they're at if they're ready and you want them to start eating more solids, then I would usually say start off with the solids when they've got appetite, when they're hungry. And then if they're still hungry, potentially because they haven't had enough or they weren't, you're doing baby led weaning, for example, and they didn't, you know, you worry they didn't get enough food. I would then um, breastfeed to top them up after um, they've actually had the, the solids, if that makes sense. Cool. Uh, oh, I missed one, sorry. Um, Natasha says, what about wanting to provide a vegetarian diet? A lot of iron nutrient foods, people always mention meat. Yeah. So a vegetarian diet that includes things like um, eggs and butter, you'll have no issue with. So eggs actually provide more iron per gram than red meat. Um, and it's one of my probably favorite foods because it tends to be very baby friendly. So if you're open to um, eggs, then I wouldn't be too worried at all. Um, Again, um, if you're vegan, so no animal products at all, it's not impossible to get enough iron to your baby, but it is a little bit more, you do need to put a bit more thought into it. So lots of beans, lots of lentils. Um, you've got to be thinking about making sure they're getting a huge variety of those things as well. Um, I've got nothing against a vegan or vegetarian diet at all. It does it is just a little bit harder um, to get some of those nutrients that you want your baby to have. So as I said, it's not, it's not um, impossible, but you do need to work a little bit harder to make sure that bub's getting all those nutrients that they need. Okay, I think I've got... Um, then Angie said, with regards to choking hazards, can babies learn how to eat these? 
A friend told me she has been giving her kids whole grapes tomatoes and that he learned how to eat them and suggested that it was safer than not introducing these at all. Have you heard of something like this? Um, that's what I was, I was saying. All these things are recommendations. Um, the recommendations always tend to err on the side of let's be extra careful because no one wants to be sued because they told some parent to, you know, give their kid whole grapes and they weren't ready and they choked, for example. This is where I said you really need to, can take it into context of your own child. You could have a child that's one and a half, potentially has a bit of low tone, and they're gonna be more likely to choke on a whole grape. Whereas like I said, you could have, my, I think my little girl was having whole grapes definitely by one and a half. So you need to kind of look at your kid, look at what they're able to tolerate. If you're obviously um, a little bit worried, it's something that should be done with supervision all the time. Um, but again, that's where your instinct and your knowledge of your child is really, really important. Um, how likely, so Rachel says, how likely is it that Bob has a dairy intolerance if they were sensitive to dairy in breast milk? Um, so there's no dairy in breast milk. I think, uh, do you potentially mean formula? Rachel? No, what I, sorry, what I mean is that I couldn't have dairy because it would give her like an upset oh, stomach. Yeah, 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 yep, 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 yep. <laughs> yep, I get you. <laughs> um, I get what you mean, yeah. So, um, bubs that do have a, um, bubs that do have a dairy intolerance will often react to their mum's breast milk. Yes, agreed. Um, so a lot of mums whose children have a severe cow's milk allergy, they find that if they eat it, yet yeah, bub will also have the same sort of symptoms because um, like with toxicants and chemicals, it gets passed through your breast milk to your baby. Um, so that potentially would be a, a sign that your bub's got a, an intolerance to dairy. So do I try giving her a little bit of dairy when she's past one years old or do I just maybe avoid it altogether? Um, a lot of mums that I've worked with with cow's milk allergy, I've recommended they do start offering it before 12 months of age. Remember we talked about those allergenic foods and stuff like that. There's two ways you could do it. One, you could try taking dairy yourself if you're still breastfeeding and see if she has a reaction. That's kind of like an interim kind of step. Um, the other thing that I usually re recommend is start off with dairy products that aren't as high in protein as um, others. So as opposed to like cow's milk, like a glass of milk, for example, you potentially could start off with something like um, like butter, for example, or um, like an unsweetened Greek yogurt. Those things tend to have a little bit lower levels of uh, milk proteins in it. So your bub's less likely to react and then just kind of go from there. That or like cheese as well. Cheese tends to have a lower amount of um, the milk proteins as opposed to, um, yeah, cow's milk, milks per se. Yeah, so start off with there. Um, the other things, um, like I said, is, um, you know, definitely there's some certain probiotics that can help um, to improve their tolerance a lot quicker. And then if you're supporting their gut immune system, their gut, sorry, their gut microbiome as well, um, that can also definitely help. Because remember, it's to do with how strong that gut um, is that has to do with their ability to cope with things that are a little bit more, um, like I said, allergenic, if that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, e any other questions? Oh, uh, Alyssa says, do you have any good website resources to use to check if things are safe for babies rather than Googling it? For example, I was recently unsure if it was okay to give babies almond or oat milk and foods before you one year old and I had to Google. Um, oh, it's a tricky one. There's a lot of different websites out there. A lot of people, a lot of recommendations. Um, generally, uh, sort of government runs. So anything that ends in like a .org or .gov tends to have a be a bit more reliable. Um, if you're looking for sort of science-based articles, um, I tend to search. Um, put in Google, whatever the question is, plus PubMed. So then you'll get up all the articles. Um, in regards to, you know, like for that in, just in regards to that particular question, um, almond or oat milk, again, um, I'm not sure what came up in your Google search. Um, they do recommend that obviously you shouldn't just be giving them that as a replacement for, you know, milk, for example, but 
yeah, um, you know, things like almond or oat milk, unless they're showing some signs of allergy, I would say would be fine to be giving in their foods and stuff like that. But yeah, if you're going for a reliable source, I tend to look for, like I said, something ending in a .org or .gov. So then their government or um, state body kind of regulations. Um, yeah. Um, Rachel has a question about giving bub water straight from tap okay or always distilled, filtered, bottled. Um, I think water is a, uh, it's interesting. Water can be a little bit controversial, I think. Um, I would say for bub, boil it to be sure if you're getting it out of the tap um, and then cool it and give them that. That just obviously would kill off potentially whether there is anything in that water. Um, if you're a little bit concerned about things, um, you know, like fluoride and other chemicals and stuff like that, then obviously, yeah, filtered, distilled. Um, bottled water, um, yeah. For me, the thing with bottled water would be more to do with um, the BPA in water and the fact that you don't know how long it's been sitting in that plastic bottle and obviously the environmental kind of effects too. So, um, you know, it doesn't cost that much to get a good filter that you can filter your water through, yeah. But yeah, if you give your bub tap water, it's not gonna, you know, that's not gonna be, that's not gonna kill them. <laughs> so if you've only got tap water and they're, you know, thirsty, then that would be completely fine. All right. Any other questions? I think I've, I don't think I've missed anyone's questions. No. Um, so yeah, was there any, did anyone else have any questions at all in regards to um, nutrition, starting solids, weaning, um, anything else related to that sort of topic at all? Was there anyone here that was interested in the baby led weaning um, at all? Yeah, I see one, I see a couple, well, yep, yeah, okay, well, I'll, Talk about baby led weaning then. Um, and like I said, if anyone needs to go, feel free to go. Um, basically, I will email you guys all um, all the information and stuff like that. And you can always refer to the recording later on if you can't hang around for this bit. But so yeah, so baby led weaning. Basically, um, baby led weaning is it's a relatively new kind of concept, I guess. Um, it was coined by a British midwife um, in 2005 and specifically refers to um, self-feeding or autonomous feeding with no direct care or intervention. So basically the baby participates in family mealtimes, they're given sort of baby-sized pieces of food and allowed to eat themselves without being spoon-fed. So they 100% control the amount, um, you know, what they eat, how quickly they eat, um, it's thought to be more relaxed and unstructured versus traditional weaning um, and the baby's um, an active participant in feeding as opposed to, you know, a passive recipient. Again, baby led weaning um, proponents do recommend starting youngest six months or no earlier than that, um, breastfeeding exclusively or, or formula feeding before that. Um, and at that age, because the oromotor and uh, motor skills are developed enough, um, they do believe that that is a good time to basically start. They don't need purees or, or to be fed by others anymore. So um, it's really important. One important concept with baby led weaning is they're not talking about completely weaning off food. Um, continuing to offer milk, breast milk or formula is especially important with baby led weaning because initially the bub might not be taking as much food as in traditional weaning methods. So um, continuing to breastfeed while baby led weaning is recommended. So a couple of advantages. One, um, obviously being very hands-on and tactile, it really allows baby a lot of sensory exploration. They can learn to chew and bite food as opposed to just swallowing food. Um, they tend to learn independent eating much more quickly than bubs that are spoon fed. Um, you know, from a mum point of view, it saves time because you don't need to cook separate meals. You don't need a mash, you don't need a puree. Baby just kind of has small pieces of what everyone else is eating. Um, um, a small study, um, and there hasn't been a lot of them, um, did say that baby led weeding seems to encourage self-guided um, satiety, so being full and hunger signals as well, because the bub has com control over how much they eat um, and they tend to self-regulate um, and 
potentially have a healthier weight gain versus just being traditionally food, spoon fed. Some disadvantages, probably the biggest one is that it's a complete, it makes a complete mess. So until babies develop more refined fine motor skills, food can end up everywhere. Um, you can't really control, you don't really know exactly how much your baby has eaten. Whereas when you're spoon feeding, obviously, you know, they've eaten, you know, half a jar of something or half a bowl. Um, and there is the possibility that your baby may not get sufficient amounts of food or nutrients like iron, especially for the first few months um, until they learn to eat more efficiently. Um, you know, we talked about iron fortified cereal, for example, it's not very baby led weaning friendly, if that's something that you are using, but at the same time, and, and this is what I talked about before, um, those naturally iron rich foods, um, you know, like your meats and your eggs, for example, are more likely to be encountered in a normal family meal, um, a, and are things that are often offered to bubs, um, that are baby led at weaning and are more bioavailable. Um, so, you know, Overall, in conclusion, baby led weaning can be a really safe um, and suitable um, form of weaning your bub and can have positive long term effects. Um, some of those potential disadvantages can actually be minimized by making sure that you know you guys are informed and educated about making sure those self feeding guidelines are followed and that food offered are actually the right texture and size, for example. And, um, you know, you just want to make sure that you're offering those nutrient dense foods so that what they are actually eating is high in those nutrients that they need. Again, it's really important to be guided by your own bub um, and their abilities. So what I've found is that most families go well with a combination of both. So some spoon feeding, some offering of food that bub can kind of play with and pick up themselves. Um, I know my sister with her little boy, um, he did not like purees at all. Um, I think he just, the texture was no good. He kind of just preferred baby led weeding. There was something about having a mushy kind of food that just, didn't sit right with him so again it's something about you really got to tune into your little kid um, and see what works best for them so hopefully that uh, answers some questions about baby led weaning um, did anyone have any questions about that particular topic then no all right all right All right, cool. Well, that pretty much sums up. So um, thanks so much. Thanks everybody for coming in and giving an hour of your time to basically sit and listen to me talk. <laughs> um, now in terms of the winner, um, I've got, and this is just random, um, Dale, D-A-Y-L-E. Sorry, I can't see you on screen. Dale, I think you've got your, are you still on Dale? Um, Dale has her video off, but Dale, Hello. sorry, are you there? Yes. Oh, hi. Is that hi. You? Oh. Yes. <laughs> no video. Congratulations. You've won. So if you just want to stay online, um, and I'll get some details off you and stuff and I can, um, arrange to post that out to you as well. Hi. Thanks very much. That's all right. Um, everyone else, um, you'll get, like I said, you'll get a recording, you'll get the notes. I'll send that extra information that I said, the choking check choking check um, as well as the safe feeding checklist as well um, and there will also be um, just an ebook with some recipes that you guys can make um, and there's also there's also a discount voucher as well for anyone needing some nutritional um, pediatric or even physio from a women's health point of view there'll be a discount voucher for all you guys that attended as well um, if you guys need and I'm more than happy if you guys think of some questions in the next few days or so, uh, feel free to email me. So um, the email that you guys got that, um, got the invite from, um, you can always email me and I'm happy to answer any questions and stuff. But yeah, it was great to see you all. And um, we might do another one potentially, Michelle, if we get ourselves organized. <laughs> all right, cool. All right, thanks guys. Have a great day. See you later. Bye. Thanks, Susie. That's all right. See you all.